Um, so uh, forgive me, everybody. Uh, I'll just backtrack slightly because I said I would record this uh, session and I've just started to introduce without uh, actually uh, explaining what's going on for the, the benefit of the recording. Um, so uh, by way of introduction again, uh, my name is Chris Maney. Um, I'm a data scientist by background um, with more of, I guess, a statistical bent and a little bit less of a computer science bent. Um, what we're going to do today is go through some regression modeling techniques in R. We're going to use the slightly older school version of them, so the stuff that's available in base R. Uh, there are a few newer ways of doing it, uh, which I'll touch on slightly today, but we'll, we'll go a little bit more theory related. Um, there are some links that are posted in the chat, um, and I presume when we put this out, wherever we record this, be it YouTube or whatever, we'll put the, the relevant links as well in the description uh, for the slides on a GitHub repository which I'm sharing on the screen at the moment. Uh, so if you know what you're doing with Git and GitHub, you could clone the repository from this link. Or if you're not so sure what you're doing with GitHub, you can click on the clone button here and click download zip, uh, and that will download a zipped version of all the files, which you can open up in your web browser here, or in your file explorer once it's downloaded. And the things we're gonna use today are the exercises here. There is a solutions folder as well, so feel free to go and browse the solutions. And these are my suggested solutions. The exercises that we'll go through are quite structured because what we're going to talk about today is if you're if you're new to regression, it might be quite a lot at once. So I don't really want to leave you flailing with some vague instructions. So they're actually quite prescriptive. They're very much now add this predictor. What does that say? How do you interpret this? So when you open these files, um, you'll see them as we go through the sessions. And I'll do the first exercise with you. There is a set of notes at the top of them explaining the data set and the different columns that are in the data set, which we'll come to later. And then each of these here, we have a, an instruction. So here it's saying firstly to draw a histogram. Now, the expectation from the way the course has been advertised in the past, and forgive me, I haven't seen the advert for it this year, um, has been that it wasn't aimed at, at people who are new to R. So I'm hopeful that all of you have at least enough grounding in R to get yourself around to draw a few charts here and there. Um, I will give some examples. And if you're not, then please don't worry, do continue to watch on the screen and I'll go through them and I will um, do my version of them as well. And you could you could see how we use it to interpret stuff. Um, but it is helpful uh, to not have to be looking everything up if at all possible. Um, so what I'm going to do next is just show you over to the cloud uh, space. So we do have our Studio Cloud set up. So there is a link again in the chat to our Studio Cloud, which I'll just repost again at the bottom for anyone who's new, can't see anything older. Uh, if you don't have R and R Studio set up on your machine, um, or you're concerned about not having any dependencies or things like that, and you want to use the cloud, uh, you're very, very welcome to. It's a free cloud setup uh, for use, uh, generally for the conference and NHSR training. So following that link will take you to this workspace. You may have to follow the link a second time because the first time may um, make you register if you've never used R Studio Cloud before and it might forget exactly where you need to land. So if you've uh, registered and then you can't see anything, do click on the link one more time and it should connect up and take you into the workspace. Uh, so I've loaded um, the uh, Git repository that we've just seen here as a project here. So this is the one regression modeling NHSR. Um, so you can see my name's again set there. So if you were to launch your own copy of that, you'll get a derived copy. So you can see other people here have got uh, derived copies. So that means you're taking a copy from my copy. Now, because I'm an admin on the workspace, I won't see one here, but you should see, um, depending on how, how it's set up, but you should see like a flashing red symbol here that says save a copy of the workspace. And that will save your own copy of the workspace, which I'd advise you to do. Um, so you can then um, work with it from there. Um, so there's a few people getting error messages. So uh, it says the space code is invalid. So let me just um, see if I can check the link for that. Oh, actually, there's a few people have connected there. Um, so the link must be working for some people then in order to do that. So let's um, see if I can just double check and repost a link. Uh, 
So I'm going to copy a direct link from there and put, and put it in again. So maybe try the second link now. Um, it might be worth trying a second time. We do, we do find, depending on the organization that you are working for or connecting from, if for some reason you've got a firewall rule that blocks our Studio Cloud, which is kind of rare, but you, you, you may do, um, it may prevent you from connecting. Um, if that's the case and you have access to R on your machine, I'd encourage you to go to the Git repository and download the files instead. Um, so message from Bruce there about a few error messages in the console related to packages. Um, is that something you could show me? I think you should be able to share your screen. Would that be OK? Hi, uh, Chris, I, I can't share the screen, unfortunately. Uh, can you not? Um, I wonder if I can allow that. I'm not a an avid Zoom user, so I'm. Uh, Sorry, Chris. This is your sharing. If you stop sharing. If I stop sharing, does that okay? Um, Do you have to make them a to make them a co-host or something to allow that or uh, no they should be able to share now okay okay so uh installing some of the packages there yep so a lot of these are just the general package installation messages, but it's particularly the okay. So it's the uh, the additional packages there for some of the slide things. So um, they these packages are actually for building the slide set rather than the exercises. So I would think, to be honest, you'd probably be all right without them. So the NHSR theme is used in the presentation, so is the sharing an extra. Um, so I can't imagine that that would prevent you from doing the exercises. Um, you would just need them if you wanted to rebuild the slide pack. So I suspect you'll probably be all right. Okay, thanks. I'll just go back to sharing my screen. Uh, so let me just bring up cloud again. Yep, so it looks like we've got quite a few people have pulled a uh, version of the project. So that might take a minute to set itself up for you and pull down. Um, but then if you have the, um, the option to save a copy of the workspace for yourself, um, that means you should have a copy then for, for posterity. Um, for ease of use for me sharing a screen, I'm actually going to work for my own local copy of our studio. Uh, and I'm going to share my slides in the web browser. So I hope everyone's been able to connect, but I'm going to kick off with some of the content now. So as I mentioned before, uh, I've got some slide content. So some of the, the background of what regression is, why we do it, how we interpret some of the outputs, how we do some of those commands in R, and then we're going to work on some exercises to go through them. So the things that we're going to do today are we're going to touch first of all on correlation. Then we'll uh, dive into linear regression. We'll have a look at how we, we build a linear regression model and how we then look at some of the outputs and interpret some of the outputs. We'll also look at uh, assessing whether or not we've got a model that means anything. They don't necessarily mean anything. if. Um, so you can build a terrible model. And if you then use a terrible model to make some sort of um, conclusion about something, then you're probably in a bad place. So then we'll look at uh, multiple regression. Uh, so by that, I mean multiple predictors. So you may hear the term uh, multivariate regression. So that's sometimes used incorrectly. And in fact, if you were on the NHSR conference, um, Frank Harrell, who was on our keynotes, said that was one of his bugbears. 
strictly speaking, if someone says a multivariate regression, what they should mean is that you're predicting multiple outcomes. So rather than having a single outcome that you're predicting with lots of predictors, it's saying you've got multiple outcomes you're predicting. But what I mean by that is that we're going to have more than one thing that dictates our outcome. We're also going to have a little look at how we use the models that we've built to then predict, because often what we want to do, having built a model, is we then want to predict future um, uh, data points, future patients, whatever it is that we're putting into the model, uh, and look at the probability of their outcome or likelihood of something or a predicted length of stay, for example. Uh, we'll also then look at a generalization of the regression modeling framework. So a linear regression works really, really well in a specific context but there's a lot more contexts that we might want to apply a regression model to. So the generalized linear model gives us a framework to apply that to some other situations. So I will mix some of the theory in and out with some examples because I'm, although I do have some training, I'm primarily an applied statistician. So um, I often need to see things in action to understand what they're doing. Do ask questions at any point as well. Um, I may find it a little difficult to fly the chat and talk and do exercises at the same time. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question at any point, please do. Um, but I will also try and keep an eye on the chat. Okay, so the core of what we're gonna look at today really is about the idea that relationships between variables. So we might, we might try and see um, how, if one thing changes, another thing changes in proportion to it. Um, which is what we tend to describe with the word correlated. So if we said one variable is correlated with another, we tend to mean that where one of them moves, the other one moves. And it may move in opposite directions or the same direction, or maybe on an entirely different scale. But we're suggesting that there is some relationship. Now we're not suggesting that relationship is causal. So for those of you who've got strong stats backgrounds or might have read things about causal inference, one of the, the key problems with regression and correlation models is they don't tell you that one thing causes another. They just tell you that when one thing changes, another thing tends to change as well. So that one of them may be caused of the other. They may also be confounded, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So it may be that one completely separate factor controls both of them. So you have to be a little bit careful about using these methods to then imply causation, because that's not what the methods say. Uh, but the thing that we're most interested in really here tends to be about the strength. So, so how much does a thing change and in what sort of direction does that association change? And the two things we'll look at for examining them. One is um, the sort of straight up thing that we tend to refer to as a correlation analysis and we de derive a correlation coefficient. So how, how much the things correlate. And then the other thing we're gonna look at is uh, a regression model. Uh, and I would say, to be honest, in, in my mind, there are a few times that you would want a correlation over regression. Most of the time, a regression model will give you more information than the correlation model. But what I'm going to use, the term I'm going to use, and this is a term you'll see in, in literature about it a lot of the time, is that we'll have a so-called dependent variable or an outcome, which we'll call Y. And then we have one or more things that are going to predict it. So that, and they're referred to as the independent variables and we'll tend to call them X. Or if we've got more than one, we might index them. So we might have X1, X2, X3, X4, et cetera. So let's see that uh, visually though on the other page. So here I've got Y on my Y axis, as you might suspect, and my X here on the X axis. So looking at that, mainly because I've engineered it, that, that looks pretty correlated, right? as X increases, it looks like Y tends to increase as well. So first of all, I would say the, the, the glorious lesson of these things is if it's something simple that you can just plot and look at, try and get your head around what it looks like first of all, because um, it tends to be one of the most intuitive ways of, of getting a grounding in what your data says. So my suggestion is often that you plot things first of all, before you go into a regression model because that plot might say something completely bonkers. So let's say that it, it, in this plot here, let's say everything less than 10, for example, on, on my x-axis was, was on the floor was a five. And then suddenly it dramatically changed at 10. But when you averaged across it, if you fitted a regression model across it, it might look like there's a, a nice clean average, but maybe it's not, maybe it's a threshold around 10. 
So it's worth plotting those points and seeing whether they seem to form some sort of smooth or directional relationship. So the, the correlation thing that I referred to a second ago then, um, we often measure that with a thing called a correlation coefficient. So it's generally a measure of, of how closely those two things correlate. And it, you usually, at most, most cases, are getting a Pearson correlation coefficient after Carl Pearson, who uh, sort of pioneered that particular technique. So when you're interpreting these things, they've got a range of minus one, um, which is a perfect negative correlation, to one, which is a perfect positive correlation. And if you get a zero, that means no correlation at all. So what does that look like with actual data points? So I've um, shamelessly stolen this from uh, Wikipedia because it's awesome. Um, so here we've got some examples of their correlation coefficients. So this is a one, this is a perfect positive correlation. So as things have increased, uh, both, well, both things have increased. Um, and there's the opposite version there with a perfect negative correlation. And you can see the various points in the middle with your zero here being no discernible relationship. So it's a kind of scatter around that. But the thing to say about correlation is it's sort of averaging over the data set, right? So if your data set does have any particular crazy patterns, you might not be able to distinguish that with the correlation coefficient alone. So you can see that everything here, these are all correlation coefficients of one. And these are all minus one because it's about how tightly the points are packed down that line. And actually, you see some quite interesting patterns, but you see some very odd patterns of things. These are all engineered, obviously, but uh, things that could display absolutely no correlation if you trust the correlation coefficient on its own. But when you plot them, you can see that there are some quite discernible shapes, obviously. So how do you do that in R? So the point of NHSR workshops is, is how do you do a thing in R generally? So in R, uh, in, in I'm going to say base, but uh, in base, I mean uh, also the stats package, which is part of the core packages. Uh, you don't have to load those packages. They're just part of R generally. So the function core for correlation uh, is called just like that. We can correlate X and Y. So I'm using the X and Y that are on that plot that we looked at a minute ago, that scatter plot. So I'm calculating a correlation coefficient for this plot. That tells me I've got a correlation coefficient of 0.865. So that's pretty high, right? So when we looked at that there, so that means that they're kind of tight and they're positively correlated. Now, if we also wanted some sort of statistical test, so I'm not going to get into the uh, statistical test wars here about whether a p-value is valid or not, but let's say you know that you want a p-value. Um, there is a, a function in R called core test, which combines a correlation coefficient and a t-test, um, which gives you um, so the same information, your correlation coefficient out of it, but it also gives you some confidence intervals and it gives you a p-value, which is, that's a very small p-value because that's a scientific notation for um, minus 16. So it's got lots of zeros before in the decimal. So it's a very small p-value. So they are, significantly correlated if we're using our 95% conventional threshold. So we know that they're strongly associated. We know that they're positively correlated because we've got a positive coefficient. But let's try and get a bit more information. So if we move into regression, regression's kind of nice because it gives us a lot more, a lot more things that we can get information out of. So what we're trying to do with the correlation type analysis and ultimately with the regression is fit a line of best fit, essentially. So this is a line of best fit through these points here. And how do you work out a line of best fit? Well, you do a regression. So we'll show you some of the mechanism of that in a minute. So what we're actually interested in doing, so forgive me, I've zoomed in to a small corner of the plot here just to make these uh, more visible. So this is actually, uh, if I go back here, this is just the bottom corner of this plot we've zoomed in on. We're interested in an origin, so the point where our line would cross the y-axis. So, so this is our intercept here. So our, our intercept tends to get denoted with an alpha, 
And then for each X that we've got, we want to work out how much our line changes for every one. So each time we go up by one here, so each unit of X, how much do we multiply it by to determine the height? Because it's a, it's a triangle, right? So we're saying if we know our starting point and we know how much to go up for each value, then we can predict any point along that line. So the essential parts about a regression are we're trying to identify the intercept term. And then for each of our predictors, we're trying to identify a beta or a coefficient, which is how much to increase or decrease because of that predictor. So that looks mathematically more like this. So we're saying why, why, so that's our outcome. So I forgive all of the uh, copious notes, but these are for you uh, to refer to afterwards. But we're saying y, so that was our y-axis, is equal to the intercept plus beta times the x value. And then because we never do it perfectly, there's always tends to be some sort of error as well. So this last term here is about the, the error. So this makes it all add up to y ultimately. And that error varies from point to point. But generally, we're trying to estimate this with the smallest possible error. And the reason I put these i's in here is because we could do this in multiple terms. Now, I know this is a 2D plot here, so we can't really visualize much further than that. But if you imagine another axis, so let's take it to a 3D plot, then you could have another x, and you could have as many x's as humanly possible. Well, more than humanly possible. Um, but our brains can't really deal with the visual interpretation of that. If you can do four dimensions, then fair play to you, but I can't. Um, so, but we can chain these because these are essentially just matrix calculations. So we can have as many X's and an appropriate beta for each X uh, as we see fit. And we'll see that later on when we add more uh, things into our regression model. But there comes a set of assumptions. And if you ignore these assumptions, with a linear regression, you're often still fairly valid, which is a dangerous ground. Um, but it's worth understanding because when you tend to extend them, some of these things can fail and you can make the wrong kind of uh, interpretation. So a linear regression is assuming that there is a linear relationship between your x and your y. So if that's a more complex relationship, then we need to put some extra terms in the model to express that complex relationship. So if there is a, a power, let's say, so maybe the square of X is the relationship, then you would need to enter that squared term in somewhere or other, because otherwise it's gonna be looking for a linear relation, or it will look for a linear relation with the square term. We also make, uh, and this is actually a really important assumption, and I'll try and explain this a little more. So we're making, the assumption that all data points are independent. So if I back up to this, none of these data points have any relationship to each other whatsoever. They're all completely independent. Now let's generalize that to patients attending hospitals for, for a minute. So I spent a lot of my career building uh, mortality rate calculations. So if you were to do um, the, the version of regression, which we'll look at later, a logistic regression, um, for all patients across the country to predict how often they died. And you're assuming that absolutely every patient is independent. It's kind of a bit naive because what we've actually got is we've got clustered patients. So patients who are treated at hospital A are a little bit more like patients treated at hospital A than they are the national average. Uh, whereas patients treated at hospital B are a bit more like hospital B average. So actually what we've got are little clusters. And if you've got an experience with clinical trials or with population uh, health statistics, you might recognize these sort of clustering arguments, uh, particularly people in the ecology and other things like that uh, also notice it. But it's the same thing as if you have repeated measurements over time. So that also is a clustered effect because if you have the same person who you have several measurements from, then you have to counter the fact that you've already measured that person. Their data points aren't independent. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the naive assumption of a regression is that all points are independent. And if your data is not independent, you should probably be using a slightly fancier model to model the extra dependency, none of which we'll go into today. So we also have an assumption about normally distributed error. So um, 
the distributions involved in this are a little bit complicated if, when you get to the extremes of them. But what we are assuming here is that this error is just normally distributed. It's essentially random. So for the most part, it'll be fairly small, but there'll be a few points at the extremes that'll be larger. So if there's any clear pattern in the error, it doesn't conform to that, then that's a sign that your model's probably wrong. So if your error term doesn't look like it's randomly scattered when you look at the plots after your, uh, your model, that's an alarm bell for this particular one. And this horrible uh, horrible thing to pronounce uh, is homoscedasticity, and you get heteroscedasticity, which is the opposite of this. But that is related to this, this thing here about the normally distributed error. So we're saying that the magnitude of the error doesn't vary across the size, um, which seems a bit abstract, but you'll see that more on the plots in a minute. So we're saying that we expect the error to be normally distributed, essentially random. But how do you actually go about estimating that thing, right? Because you don't just look at it and work it out. So what we do is we use an algorithm to work it out. So we've got this model, and then we use an algorithm to work out how to reduce the error. And the thing that we use for this is a thing called ordinary least squares, or OLS. So if you've come about uh, doing regression at other points, you might have seen comments in the help files like saying OLS or mean squared error or things like that, which is all this, the same technique. So what we're looking at is a so-called residual distance between the point that we predict on our best fit line and where the data point actually was. So what we do is we take that error and we square it, because if that error is negative, so if the, point is, the data point is below the line um, and other data points above the line, they essentially even out and your error term becomes zero, and that's not true. So we square it, and by the time you square it, the sign become, is removed. So we minimize the so-called sum of the squares of the error. So what does that look like? So this is the residual distance. So our model says, according to an origin and a coefficient, all data points should be along this line, plus some error. And these black lines here are that error, that residual error. So you take each one of these black lines, their value, you square them, and then the algorithm tries to minimize that square to work out where to put the line. So that's that's what a linear regression is doing. And it actually has an exact numerical solution to it. So linear regression is not very taxing for your machine. So when you do a linear regression, you can get a, an exact solution for it. So how do you build one? So I've got a couple of preferences, which we'll go through today. So when we get to building them, uh, I'll explain them. I'm gonna suggest that whenever you build a model today, don't just build the model, create an object with the model. So assign that model to an object name so that you can go back. Maybe don't call it model one because that's terrible model, you know, terrible naming conventions, but I've used it here. So when you create a linear model, we're gonna use this LM to create a linear model. Call it something just so you can then reuse the output later. So here, the syntax then of a linear model is the Y, the thing we're predicting, then this tilde uh, sign here, which is a formula. So interpret that as Y is explained by X. And then you need to tell it the data set that it's coming from. So here I've got a data frame in R called my data and I've got a column called Y and a column called X. And that's what I used to build this plot that we saw here. So this is um, uh, literally the model that I used for that red line. So linear model, Y is predicted by X and here's the data that it comes from. So once you created this model one, you can then use it with lots of other functions. So generic ones, so like the print function, the summary function. So this is the one I'm going to point you to first of all, because this is the one that gives us loads of useful stuff on the output. We're also going to use plot and we're going to use predict. So these are a couple of examples here. So this is the summary function. So to, to get this output, so it had to try and enlarge it so you could see the output. So forgive me, it hasn't got the call at the top of the screen. But what I've done there is I've got written summary, open brackets, model one, close brackets. And this is the model summary. So it's telling me that I created a linear model where y was explained by x 
this is a description of the residuals. So you know that plot before where we saw the black lines? Uh, if you were to then plot them as if they were a scatter, sorry, as a histogram plot, this is a, a description of the distribution. So it's telling me the minimum value, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the max. Now, practically speaking, I don't use that, but it, you know, it's a piece of information that if you can visualize something from the quartiles, then maybe you can use that. But this is the thing that we're interested in here. This is the output of our model. So our model is saying that our intercept value was 5.4776. Uh, so let's have a look back at the plot. Does that look reasonable? 5.4776? Yeah, so it looks reasonable to me. So it's estimated our intercept there. Am I jumping around? I should have put another slide near this. Uh, and it's saying that for each increase in X, then Y increases by 1.2507. So we're saying we could predict any Y value by knowing the X. So we have the 5.4776 and so plus 1.25 times X would give us our value of Y. And there's a few other things here. So this is the uh, the standard error for that. Um, I won't go into standard error stuff particularly today, but that is then used to do a significance test, uh, which is a, a p-value on the end here. So it's done with a t-test. Um, so these are both, again, statistically significant if you're using them at 95% because they're less than 0 0.005. And R has got this kind of helpful notation on the end here, which you can see it's explained underneath. This is a significance code for the p-value. So if the p-value is about is as small as it can get towards zero, it'll give you three stars. Um, if it's 0 0.001, it'll be two. 0 0.01, if it's 0.5, so these are all like a less than kind of criteria. So the idea is that this is a handy key to tell you which of your predictors are significant. Then you've got a few other things at the bottom here as well. Importantly, uh, the adjusted R squared. So this is, the proportion of the variation uh, explained in the model. So we're saying that this model explains 74% uh, of the variation. So X explains 74% of the variation in Y. And there's a few other things as well. So uh, we won't talk about F statistics and things today or degrees of freedom particularly, um, but that's probably your most important thing out of uh, a linear model to assess the fit. So to reiterate then that interpretation, so it was the intercept was 5.48 and our coefficient then was 1.25. Now for me, when I was learning regression, this was the painful bit about regression, right? It was forcing myself to interpret the parameter predictions at the end, because it's very easy to just look at them and go, oh great. But you if you have to reconcile them in your head, it will really help you learn exactly what's coming out. Chris, I think you've gone on mute. Hello, thank you. Yeah, I got disconnected for a second there. Thanks. Okie doke. So, um, so I was ranting at you slightly there, wasn't I? I was saying, please try and force yourself to interpret these model coefficients. So I would say to interpret that then, for each increase of one in my X value, Y increases by 1.25, starting from 5.48. And that helps you reconcile what's going on there. And there is a further thing that people often do, which is uh, referred to as mean centered and scaling as well. So we'll do this in the exercise too. So let's say you've got more than one X and those X's are on really different scales. Am I not showing my screen? Sorry, got disconnected, yep, so yep. So here we go, yep. So what I was saying there was our intercept being 5.48 and our coefficient 1.25 was for each increase of one in X, Y increases by 1.25, starting at 5.48. So the last bit of really before we start diving into some exercises is that this mean centered and scaled interpretation is another way of putting your parameters in. So 
if you want to put some parameters in. Sorry, that, Chris, I think we're, we're seeing the wrong bit of your screen. I'm not sure. Uh, you're on the wrong thing. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Right. I got um, disconnected now. I'm all flustered. There we go. Is that the right song now? Can you see the uh, the slides? Oh, brill. Thank you. I got a thumbs up. Fantastic. Um, yep. So the mean centered interpretation. So what that actually does is that rather than use X, we use X minus the average X divided by the standard deviation of X. Now that might sound a bit contrived, but that's a thing called a Z score. So you might have seen a Z score in other places, but it's a standardized score based on the units of standard deviation. So a Z score of one means one standard deviation above the mean. A Z score of minus two means two standard deviations below the mean. So you, you are turning them into like a standard unit and that unit is the standard deviation of whatever you're measuring. And if you are, if you've got two, let's say you've got two X values and they're massively different scales, one's in the thousands and one's in the, the tens, it might be that the thing that's in the thousands just naturally dominates because it's so much bigger. But if you converted those things into mean centered and scaled versions, you could be considering both of them in terms of uh, how much they've changed in their standard deviation. So it's kind of a, a, a neat trick, but it also makes your interpretation of things a little bit easier as well. So you'll see this is the original that we just predicted before. But if I use that scaled version, and the only thing that is different is that you wrap x in the function scale instead, you can see that the parameter estimates change there. So we've got an 18.24, and we've got um, a, a scaled x of 4.72. So the nice thing is that the interpretation means that this becomes the value for the average data point now. So your interpretation is that this 18.24 is the average value of y. And then for each increase in standard deviation, it will go up 4.72. And your p-values and your r squared are exactly the same, because it's exactly the same model. You just scaled the input slightly. So our interpretation then is our average, um, so that should be our average y rather than average x, sorry, um, is 18, whereas each increase of um, one in our standard deviation increases it by 4.7. Now, I will just show you a couple of plots and then we'll get into doing something interesting. So how do you know if your model's terrible? Again, I'm gonna suggest that you plot it. So the same thing that we did before with a summary is you wrap in, in plot. So you do model, you do plot, open brackets, model one, and then you'll get a bunch of measures. And the things that you're probably most interested in are the residuals, so this is this error term here versus the fitted value, so that's what you would predict. So if this is a, a nice random distribution and this line is functionally kind of straight, then your model's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Oh, sorry, um, so I question there about um, scaling from NOAA. So um, the point of scaling is so there's two points. Number one is that so you can pivot your interpretation to be about the average um, data point and then see how much the average data point changes in terms of standard deviation. Um, if you don't like that and don't find that very helpful, the other reason to do it is um, if you have predictors, let's say you've got X1 and X2 and X1 and X2 are on really different scales. Sometimes a difference in scale can cause problems in your model and putting them both on the scale of their own standard deviation uh, ameliorates that to some degree. It removes the, the difference in scale uh, and it allows your model to do a better job of estimating both of them. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, hopefully we'll, we should be able to see that again uh, in the, the exercise in a minute. Um, so some of these are the plots. Um, we won't go in too much into interpreting them, but this is a normal QQ plot, so a quantile quantile plot. So you have a line across this plot here, and you're hoping that these points here, your residuals, mostly line up across the uh, the range of the data point. They tend to deviate at the very ends uh, 
But if you had, uh, let's say you had a huge deviation in the center here, that would be quite worrying. The model wouldn't be a good fit. So I've talked at you for ages. So that's quite difficult over Zoom. So I'm gonna suggest we have a five, 10 minute break. Um, do go and get yourself uh, a drink, uh, have a comfort break. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up the first of the exercises uh, and I'll walk through that with you. Um, so what is it now? It's just gone quarter to uh, three. So should we say uh, back at five to three? Okay, I'll see you again in a minute then. Thanks. Okay, hello again, everyone. Uh, thanks for bearing with me whilst I talked at you for such a long time there. I was trying to set the scene a little bit for you. So with a regression model, we're predicting y with x, and we're going to use the lm function to do that. So let's do that with some actual data. So if you're using cloud, um, do go into the cloud workspace and pick up the exercises. So that will be in your files menu here. So if you go down and you find exercise one and two. We're going to do one first of all. And what we'll do here is that I'll run through one with you. And you've got a couple of options. Uh, you can either type it in and try doing it yourself. Uh, you can watch what I'm doing and absorb that. Um, or there's a solutions version here. So you can open the solutions and you can run the sections of that. Um, I will give you time to do the other exercises as we go. But uh, for the first one, I'll run through that with you and explain, because it's, it's a slightly opinionated take on it, essentially. Some of this is that I think we should do, uh, do it this way. But what we're going to use um, is uh, data from the Framingham study. So those of you in public health or you've done training around, uh, I, I guess, clinical trials or this, you might be familiar with the Framingham study because it's a, a very long standing cohort study. Um, that has been quite instrumental in us un understanding relationships with smoking and some long-term conditions. But we're going to pick up some of the Framingham data. So this data is stored in the repository here. So when I run this piece of code here, Framingham, read CSV, it's going to pick up the Framingham CSV data and load that for me into my environment. So I click on environment there. Um, I have a bunch of things in my environment already. Let me just, I'm just going to clear the environment and do that again. So, read it there. Now, there's a lot of notes in here, but that's because I'm trying to explain to you what the data is and where it comes from. And then I've got a little key here explaining what all the variables are because they're actually coded, some of them. So, education, for example, it's coded one, two, three, four. Uh, as you might suspect, that's uh, American um, and its levels uh, of education. But obviously, two is not two times one. You know, it's an ordinal variable. It's not a quantitative um, sort of, uh, numeric variable. So some of these things are coded, uh, like this column here called male, which is uh, zero. So it's a logical for anyone who's female. Uh, and it's a one for anyone who's male. Uh, we do have numerics like cigs per day, number of cigarettes um, smoked per day as an estimated average. We've got another logical type thing here for current smoker, which is zero for non-smoker and one for smoker. And other things like prevalence of stroke, prevalent uh, hypertension, whether or not they're on blood pressure medication, whether they had diabetes, their total cholesterol. And importantly, we're going to look at their blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, so CIS-BP, and diastolic blood pressure. So before we do this, though, I think you probably need a little bit of an idea of what the data looks like. So I think if anyone is doing a regression analysis, if you don't have a look at what the data is like first, you might get into trouble. So if you want to just get a quick overview, I really recommend the summary function. So if you use the summary function and wrap it around Framingham there. So I've put this on the script regardless, just so you can go through and see. Now. You have to sit here interrogating it for a minute. It doesn't make sense for things like this because that's coded. But for age here, that's quite helpful. So we've got the minimum age of anyone in the study was 32. The first quartile, so 25%, was 42. 
the median age, so that's the, the middle value of the ages, was 49. The mean was 49.58. Now, if the mean and the median are quite similar, that's a reasonably good anecdotal way to tell that the data is not skewed. If they're quite different, it tells you that there's some skew there. Um, the third quartile, 56, and the maximum is 70. So our, our age range is from 32 to 70, and the median's 49. And this is true for some of the other values as well. So you can interpret it there from the summary. Um, you could also, if um, like me, I I started doing analysis with Excel like lots of people. So I'm quite used to seeing like a spreadsheet type view in front of me where I can see the top lines of the data. So I find it quite useful to, to use view, uh, which is the same thing as you can click directly on the data set and it opens it up in view as well. But to have a look through the top few lines helps me understand what's what. So I could see that's coded zero, one as the age is, education, et cetera. So personal preference, and there's loads of other functions. There's sort of the skimmer, there's all the data reader stuff. Um, you can use tidyverse to go and interrogate it, cut it up however you like. So however it helps you to understand it, but I like to have a quick look at the data and then I like to kind of plot things normally. So the first part of this exercise then is to say, let's, let's visualize it. So we're gonna look at systolic BP, cis BP from that data set. And then we're gonna to look to see whether there's any sort of relationship with BMI. So, so that's the body mass index. So firstly, first instruction here is then draw a histogram or a box plot or something that you like to look at the distribution of the cis BP um, variable. Now for those of you who like base R, that with hist um, and uh, our data frame is called Birmingham using the dollar sign there for, I'm using the autocomplete because I'm lazy. And if you run that, you get a histogram of the systolic blood pressure. Okay, so it looks a little bit skewed there. So we've got a longer tail at the high end. And our midpoint here for systolic blood pressure looks to be around, what, 140-ish. Or if you are more of a ggplot person, I must confess, I am to, um, let's just do tidyverse. That's a lot of things that work together. Um, so to do that, I might go, this spelling, Framingham's 1M, by the way. If you ever try and use Framingham loads of times, uh, <laughs> doing the double M might really annoy you. Uh, I have some uh, experience in that. Um, ggplot. To, I'm going to use an aesthetic where I say that uh, x equals cis EP, and then I need a geome histogram and um, let's make it look less ugly shall we um, is my default color I'm also going to use alpha, which is transparency, because I like it. And let's do color equals. Um, and you can change all the bin widths or whatever, but that, that gives you a nice distribution. So it's not perfectly normally distributed. You've got a few high outliers there, but I think we'd probably be OK for the most part to treat that as, as if it's normally distributed. So we're, we're going to sort of go with that. So that was just the systolic blood pressure. So that's just our outcome variable. But let's see whether they're related to BMI then. So the, the next part is let, let's then scatter them, scatter a systolic blood pressure and, and BMI against each other. So um, you could do that with the simply the plot function and do the X and Y if you like that. Um, but I am going to go straight to ggplot here. I'm going to copy it because, again, I'm lazy. So I'm going to use, um, uh, and now, because I'm going to treat systolic blood pressure as the thing I predict, I'm going to change that over to Y. I'm going to say X is um, BMI. And the ggplot syntax for plot is a geome point. <laughs> 
do that. It's the ugly plot, but okay. So we've got a reasonably tight circle of points there. Now, if you kind of squint at it, it might sort of look a little bit like as BMI goes up, systolic blood pressure goes up. But it's not it's not really clear, is it? It's not like it's not smacking you in the face and telling you there's a really obvious relationship there. So maybe if we build our linear regression model, we can try and quantify some of that relationship. So let's get on to the next bit. And what we're going to do is we are going to call this, uh, because I'm terrible at naming things, model one. So if you remember before on the slides, I suggested if we're going to create a linear model, assign it to a name so it's something you can reuse later. So we're going to call model one is an LM. So your instructions here say use the LM function. So anytime you're trying to use a function that you don't know loads about, may I humbly suggest you go and use the help, um, which I don't wish that to sound as patronizing as it does. Um, but you'd be surprised the number of times the help file has really saved me when I've been trying to do something. And for some reason, it's trying to make me right LMAP there. LM. So here, like most things in the help, it does a good job. So it's telling you the first thing it expects is a formula, which is our Y is predicted by, and then it also expects data, and then it will take a bunch of other things as well. But if we give it a formula and some data, we should be good. And there's other, there's more help here about what exactly constitutes a formula. But if you remember before, it was our Y, so sys BP, then use the tilde is explained by BMI. And we need to give it data. So our data frame is called Framingham. So there we go, I've created a model. And you can see because I gave it a name, it's become an object in my workspace and I could reuse it. So let's look at the output. So before I recommended using the summary function. So use summary. I will put model one inside summary. Okay, so this is the thing that we saw on the slide before. So we've got a summary of the call. So that's the, the call is a model that you asked for. That's the distribution of those residuals. So we've got an intercept here of 86.92. Now, that might be the intercept, but that doesn't really mean that because what patient's got a systolic blood pressure of um, 86, well, it'd be a patient with a VMI of zero. So um, yes, it works in terms of our chart, but it's harder to interpret. But it means that for each value of BMI, we multiply the BMI by 1.76. So 86.92 plus BMI times 1.76 predicts the systolic blood pressure according to our model. Now, let's have a look at whether or not it's a good model. So if you remember, we talked about the adjusted R squared before. So R squared is a proportion of one. So if it was one, it would be perfect. It would be 100% uh, of the variation in our model is explained by our predictors. So here it's 0.1. So that's 10%. So 10% of the variation in systolic blood pressure is explained by BMI. And yes, it is significant, but it's not its not explaining a lot, yeah? So this is one of the powerful things with the regression that you wouldn't get with a correlation coefficient. So you would know that there's a correlation and that correlation is significant, but you probably wouldn't know that actually it doesn't explain a whole lot of the model. And maybe we need to include some more things in it. So how much of our variation uh, so we answered that question there. Forgive me, I've skipped over a couple of questions. But I also was talking to you about the idea of scaling. So this intercept currently is sort of meaningless. Oh, we've got a quick question there about uh, the scatter plot. There's a couple of points that like I, I'll use. Uh, can you get um, info from LM to detect these? Um, so you can do if you plot them. Um, so 
Um, let me just do that for a second. So where we did summary, uh, I also showed you some of the diagnostic plot things. If you plot model one, um, because it gives four plots as an output, it gives you this hit return to show the plots. So you can actually start to see which of these points are outliers in terms of their predictions. So this might not be 100% what you're asking. Sorry if it's not. Um, but you can see which of the data points are uh, outliers. And it gives you an index number. So this will tell you that um, uh, row 865 in our data frame um, is an outlier here. So these are the ones that are the, the furthest from the predictions. And these are the ones that you might want to go and investigate in terms of being the things that are affecting your model. So that's the residuals. So the error versus the fitted values. So these have got much higher error than any of the other points. Um, let's look at the other plots. Um, so that's the normal QQ plot that I was saying before. Um, so you can see here, that actually, it's not really sitting on the line very well here. <laughs> that's because we're only explaining 10% of the variation in our model. So that's maybe a, a reminder that our model is not the best. So again, you have a, a version of a standardized residual. So this is uh, less of a problem in this particular case, but if you are using um, some of the generalized linear models that we looked at later, uh, the square root, so the standardized residuals is, is a slightly more robust way of looking at them in a GLM. But again, we've got the same sort of thing here with the outlier things. Um, and the one at the end here, um, is uh, residuals versus leverage. Um, and these are the data points that most affect your model if they were to be deleted. So if you removed them, they would have the most impact on your model. Um, whether that impact is good or bad is, is up to you. And whether or not you choose to delete variables or remove outliers is entirely an analytical choice up, up to you. Um, there are some schools of thought that say, if you delete any point from something, you're losing information and maybe you should treat them another way. Uh, there's another school of thought that says sometimes you just enter the wrong thing and if it's really obvious that there's a data quality error or something like that then uh, maybe you can sacrifice that data point um, so it's very much an analytical choice so it's up to you and um, provided you represent that properly when you um you, you give your output uh, many things can be reasonable i'm sorry i was just going to do the the stand the scaled version of it so i'm going to call this Model one scaled with an underscore, although I can't spell obviously today, scaled. We do the same thing as we did before. And again, I'm gonna copy it because I'm lazy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap BMI in the scale function. as a reminder of what that's doing, that will now mean that every value instead of the BMI, I will get the BMI minus the average BMI divided by the standard deviation of BMI. So that will mean that a value of zero here is the average BMI that's going in. A value of one is one standard deviation above the average. And it means that our intercept then becomes the average blood pressure. This is why the scaled model can actually, although it seems a bit esoteric when it's on the slide and we're talking in concepts, um, it actually becomes a little bit more useful in real practice here because we're not really interested in the, the blood pressure of a patient with a zero BMI. We're more interested in the average blood pressure of a patient and then how that changes with something like the standard deviation. So an increase of one standard deviation in the BMI um, uh, leads to a, a, a seven fold increase. So we would multiply that some deviation by the seven. So again, you'll see it's the same model. So the R squared is still, sorry, the adjusted R squared is still rubbish. So it's no better model because we've scaled it. It's just slightly easier to interpret because our intercept becomes useful. It becomes the average value. So, our interpretation then is the, so again, it's painful, but make yourself do it. Uh, the average blood pressure of a patient is uh, 100, systolic blood pressure is 132. 
and an increase of one standard deviation would um, increase that by 7.18. So our second exercise is going to be multiple regression. So we've got, we've had one predictor so far, BMI, but we'll start looking at other predictors. And just before we do that, I'm going to throw a few more slides at you, forgive me. So we want to do more than one dimension really, don't we? So how do we then interpret that? If you've got more than one thing in the model, well, actually how we interpret it is that we have this um, stock phrase, uh, but which but is actually our interpretation is holding all of the parameters constant. So the model is estimated. Uh, so let's say we've got X one, two, three. So X one is the value that holding X two and three constant and X two is the value holding X one and three constant. Yeah. So we are saying the value of the coefficient is without the others moving. So they're functionally fixed. So the change in Y whilst holding all other parameters constant. And you simply expand your formula here. So after the tilde by using a plus. So we can add more terms, as many terms as you want using plus. Uh, how many is too many terms? Um, there's quite a lot of thought about that. So if you start to approach, um, so generally you need at least 10 results in a linear regression model per predictor. Um, but that really varies depending on what you're looking at. So if you start getting lots of predictors, you need to maybe do a little bit of work and research on how many predictors is it reasonable for you to have in your model. There are other ways around it with things like penalized regression and you might see or read about things like ridge regression or lasso regression or things like that, which um, have penalties applied to them. But for general usage, you have to be a little bit wary if you're throwing everything in the kitchen sink in. Um, because there should, I think most people tend to agree that the best way to do it is include all things that you think have a plausible link. So don't include things for the sake of them. Um, but if they have a plausible link, it's best to put them into the model. But also here, let's have a think about categorical stuff. So, I, you know, I showed you the index of the, the different data columns before. So some of those things were coded. So we had uh, whether or not the patient was male was coded. The education level was coded. Uh, but models don't understand that. If you just put them in as a number, they're going to just count them. They're going to think like two education is two times one education, which is not really what we're after. So we need a way to explain that to the model. And that's where we have a data type called a factor. So a factor is a categorical variable and factors are used in our in loads of different places. You may already have used factors, but models understand the linear model family, the generalized linear model fa family understand what factors are and it automatically treats them the right way. So it does a thing called dummy coding, uh, which is, you know, is, is no slight to it. It's not calling them ridiculous or anything or silly, um, but the idea is that it pivots them out. So let's say you've got something here that's got three categories. You've got a variable that can take the form of A, B, or C. When we put that as a factor, and that factor is dummy coded, what it does is we drop one of them, first of all, so we drop A. So we assume that all data points are A, and then we test for whether or not one of them is B, or one of them is C. So everything becomes a binary choice. So we have a reference level, and each level of the factor is difference from reference. So when we fit that model, category B, the, the coefficient for category B will be the difference between B and A, and the coefficient for C will be the difference between C and A. So with a factor, with a categorical thing, we've always got a reference level, and every coefficient that we get out is difference from the reference level. So you'll see that as we go through. And if you code them in your data as a factor, or you put a factor around it in the model, R will understand you don't have to code the uh, the dummy coding for it, it will do it for you. So let's have a go at that. So let's go back across to the exercises that you're in before and carry on down here with part two. I'm gonna give you um, 
maybe 10 minutes or so to, to make a start on that and then I'll start going through it myself and whatever stage you're at you can you can see me catch up to you uh, if anyone's got any questions you know feel feel free to shout them out and um, you can answer them but uh, do have a go at adding some more things in so we're going to start with BMI plus current smoking status and then we'll also look at BMI and age So I'm going to pause the recording there. Okay, I hope you've had a few minutes to go and uh, refresh your drinks or uh, just have a break away. What I'm going to do for the last half of the session is take what we've learned here about the linear regression side of things and let's apply them to things that aren't linear uh, in quite the same way. So if we've got non-linear data, how do we start doing the same sort of things we, we try and do here? So the examples I'm going to use because I, I work in hospital data mostly, is uh, monitoring mortality, so monitoring death. So uh, death is either true or false, with zero or one. Uh, there isn't, uh, we, we could count deaths and consider them in that way, uh, but if we're modeling an individual patients, whether or not they, they have a certain risk of death, for example, um, then the outcome is, is alive or dead there isn't any middle ground so you can't then do a linear model in the same way because there's only two possible outcomes uh, now length of stay in hospital is another one um, so you might think that's a count surely it's linear um, and count data can be linear once it starts to get large enough um, but the thing with count data is that you can't uh, in true count data um, you can only have integers or real numbers you so you can only have zero one two three four five so uh, in a, a lot of hospital data sets we don't tend to have uh, the times that people were in hospital for so we have calendar days so we can count the days um, so from that data set regardless of the fact of whether or not a patient could have been in for two and a half days from the data set in question because we only have dates we can only count it as uh, one two or three we couldn't have 2.5 because our data is not structured like that so any kind of count um, actually isn't particularly when it's a low low numbers count so length of stay where we're talking one two three four days but some people are in 20 40 60 but not very many of them um, we actually end up with a very kind of skewed distribution that truncates very hard at zero because you can't be in less than zero days so although you would think, because it's numeric, it might work, it, it actually doesn't. It's uh, more like what we would refer to as a Poisson distribution. Um, so the Poisson distribution is kind of the classic count distribution. Um, and that's because it can't go below zero and it can't take the space between the integers. It can't take any decimal position. Uh, and then there are lots of other types of data which all have specific um, distributions and ways we can do that. Actually, we can apply some of the general, the uh, the linear modeling functions uh, through a generalization. Um, now, this is a sort of a cornerstone of statistics. Um, so often, and Nelda and McCulloch are, are credited for that, but it was, I believe, it was slightly earlier than them by by one of the authors and someone else. Uh, but the idea is that if we transform the thing that used to be our y by something. Um, maybe it could be linear on the transformed scale. So the thing here that is this mu, this takes the position of the y that we had before. And strictly speaking, they tend to refer to this as the expectation of y through a function. So we apply a function to the output, uh, to the expected output, essentially, and then we build a linear model. And you'll notice here that I haven't got the error term on the end because the error works slightly different. So we tend to refer to it as the variance at this point in time, and that's actually absorbed into the intercept, which renders the intercept slightly more problematic for its interpretation. But on the plus side, we can apply a lot of our um, regression theory across to things 
um, that aren't linear through the virtue of this generalization. Um, so we're particularly going to look at um, binomial um, stuff today, but I also mentioned Poisson for counts as well. Uh, for those of you who have a stronger statistical background, uh, it might mean something to you that these uh, the generalized linear model family works, uh, as far as I'm aware, on any member of the exponential family of distributions. Uh, there's a link here for those of you who might want to go and read more about that. Um, some of them are harder to model than others, and there are some outside the exponential family that do work. Um, so there's one referred to as a negative binomial, which is a, a very good for small counts or things that might um, have clustering in them. Um, so the key thing to understand is that we have a thing that we refer to as the link function, and that link function is this G here that transforms the thing that's going into the model. Now. We can't use the ordinary least squares thing. So, you know, before when we drew the arrows for the residuals, so it was a distance that the points were away from the line that we predicted, and we squared them and then we reduced them. So that actually doesn't work in this context because uh, the distribution of things above and below that line wouldn't be the same because of the, of the transformation. Um, but there is another technique that we can use, uh, which, uh, for the, again, for those of you with a stronger stats background, you might be familiar with the likelihood function. But the likelihood function is kind of the, the opposite side to the probability function. It's a how likely a given set of data is given a, a probability. Um, that was a terrible description. But uh, go and look up likelihood if you're interested. But the idea is that we can use uh, a maximum likelihood estimation. And we can actually use maximum likelihood on a linear model. It's just that OLS is faster and quicker and uh, is mathematically equal. So uh, where we can use OLS, we do because it's um, it, it's quicker. Now, maximum likelihood doesn't have an exact solution. It's an iterative method. So it, it has a go and then it has an, another go and then it tests whether or not it's nearer. Um, and it does this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until it hits a threshold where it says, I can't get any better and then it stops. Now, there's some very sensible thresholds set naturally in all of these functions. So you don't have to worry about what that threshold is uh, unless you want to start getting into the mechanics of why a particular model doesn't converge, uh, which is outside the scope of today. But generally, you don't have to worry about this estimation. You can uh, you can allow the GLM function to do this for you. Um, but if you start getting into models that really don't converge and you think they should, uh, you might have to consider about exactly how that, that function is estimated. Um, so handily, we can use much of what we just used for LM, but with GLM instead. Um, but we can't use the R squared function, but there is an equivalent um, type of thing for uh, logistic regression at least, uh, which is referred to as the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve, which is a mouthful, but AUC or the C statistic, which you can interpret in the same way as though as a proportion of variation that's explained by your model. Uh, there's also a value called the AIC as well, and I find the AIC very useful. Um, but the AIC itself doesn't mean a lot, but they're relative. So if you're comparing two, two uh, takes on the same model, uh, the one with the lower AIC is better. So I've wrapped a couple of extra things around this here just for presentation, but I'm using the count data package because that's got a data set called MedPAR, which we're going to use in this example here. Um, so this is just to load the MedPAR data set. Uh, so MedPAR um, is a, um, a cut from some US medical data, uh, publicly published medical data in the US. Um, and I'm going to do a binomial GLM. So this is for whether or not a patient died. So it's a zero one. Now, according to the things that are in this particular data set, um, the things that were predictive, so um, they had a binary variable about whether the patient was aged 80 or over. Now, it might have been nicer to have the age of the patient, but we didn't. We have a, whether or not they're 80 or over. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we, because it's only a single level factor, we didn't really need to wrap that in factor, but there's no harm in doing so. We've also got the length of stay. So this is a numeric. So for each increase in the number of days, um, it will increase up. And then we've got a factor of type. And you have to forgive me, I can't remember exactly what the, the type referred to, but it was a, a factor variable. 
So I've wrapped that in factor. We've got the data set. And the other big difference from the LM function is that we have to specify a family. So I said before that the GLMs can be used with any member of the exponential family. Now, most of the time, I suspect you're probably going to want to do um, a, a logistic regression, which is which is this one. Um, so for a logistic, you'll want a family of binomial because that's the, the probability distribution of a zero one. Uh, or if you're doing the count data, you want the family of the Poisson distribution, like we said before. Uh, but for those of you who want to dive a bit deeper into that, you probably have to go and learn and work out what distributions are suitable for what types of data. But if you're doing a zero one, um, the binomial distribution um, is the one that we use. Now, you don't have to specify the link function because this knows that there's a default link function for the binomial family, and that is a so-called logit transformation which is the log odds of the event. And I'll talk a bit about odds in a minute. So this will do this when you, because you specified binomial, it goes, oh yeah, brilliant. I'll do a logit transformation of your Y variable for you. So what it's actually predicting is the log odds of death for the patient rather than the zero one. Uh, so I've also wrapped my model output rather than in summary, because summary gives quite a lot. Um, I've wrapped it in something from the SJPlot package called tab model, which is just a slightly nicer formatted table. So it's the same stuff. It's, it's exactly what you're getting at the summary function. Um, it just looks a bit nicer. So here, just as we've got before, we've got an intercept. We've got a factor for age. We've got length of stay. And we've got the factors here and again we've got interpretations of the uh, so this has been transformed into the odds ratio because I didn't turn it off um, uh, so the thing I was going to tell you but I've, I've floored myself with my own uh, rewrite of my slide um, is that by default these factors the, these uh, coefficients that we had before they're differences in log odds which don't really mean anything to you or me they are they mean something relative so you can say that a larger one is larger than the other um, but it it doesn't um, it doesn't is is very hard to directly interpret what a log odds is because like odds odds is tricky enough for humans right. But let's park that for now, and I'll explain what an odds ratio is in a minute. But there's a handy transformation where we can move them into these odds ratios, and they have a much more intuitive um, interpretation. But handily again, we've got our p values here. And I also said um, about the AUC before being like the equivalent of the R squared. So it's a proportion of variation explained by our model. So I've used the AUC. So the AUC is in the model metrics package. And I, I like that function because it works very well because I can just give it the model. I don't have to give it the predictions and the, the inputs and things. So I'm using the model metrics package here. So AUC, and I've put the model that we created in there and it's telling me 0.63. Seven, so 0.63, so 63.7 percent of the variation in our model is explained by these factors. So a lot of it, as you can see, the clues in the name is kind of generalizable from the linear model over, and there are complications. But for the purposes of today, let's focus on the things that are common between those models. So if you're doing something that isn't a numeric variable, you could probably do it with a generalized linear model. Now I also mentioned before fact. Uh, interactions so you know we were talking about age and smoking and how some of those effects masked each other well when the effects mask each other what you might want to do is to tell the model that somehow so you might want to tell the model that it needs to understand um, age and smoking and then the combined effects of age and smoking so it could separate out the different components of it and you could do that with an interaction effect so you can code them in two ways. You can code them rather than with a plus, you code them with an asterisk, so like a multiply. Um, so that corresponds to the two terms on their own and then the combined term. Or you can use the, um, the colon, and the colon means just the combined term, not the two separate on their own. So I've got an example here. So I'm saying that length of stay might interact with age. So why might I say that? So let's consider for older patients, um, it might be 
normal for older patients to stay in hospital slightly longer on average than younger patients. So that might not be directly contributory towards the outcome. That might just be part of normal care. So to assume that um, length of stay is completely independent of age might be a little bit, um, I, I guess, willfully blind to something that might that might vary actually in combination. So in order to test that, I've put the interaction term in there to see if there's any additional effects of length of stay. So we've got the factor of whether the age is uh, over 80 or not. So if you're over 80, the odds ratio increases. So it increases uh, is over one. So it's 0 0.69, 1.69. And we have a length of stay. So the longer you're in hospital, the odds ratio actually reduces. But if you look at the combination of length of stay, actually for elderly patients, it, it is actually slightly above. So the, the combination, um, of the two also has a separate effect, but that effect is not significant here. So sometimes it's worth putting it into test. So it hasn't really contributed to our model particularly here, um, but it has. Uh, it was worth us testing. So sometimes interaction terms, the including of interaction terms and the knocking them out is worth doing when you're trying to work out whether bits of your model interact. But I did mention that odds ratio thing before. So because of GLM, generally just gives you these things out, which is the change in the link function. So the change in the odds of death in our case with the model we just presented, it doesn't mean an awful lot to you. What you can then do is you can back transform them. So what I've done there is use the EXP function, the exponentiate function, which is the inverse function of the logic, uh, of the logit. So um, it's kind of the mathematical opposite of it. So you can get the coefficients out and you can do the opposite. Um, but the nice thing about the table I presented there is this table does it automatically. And I'd forgotten that when I included it. So uh, you can turn it off, but this table, because it's geared towards helping people do regression analysis, it says you obviously don't want them on the link scale. You want them in an odds ratio. So it converts them over. So you can see there my converted version. So you can always at any time pull those out of the model and apply a function to them if you want to transform them back. And there's uh, there's always an inverse function of the things that are used as a link function. You might just have to, to Google around or look in the help to find out what it is. So enough talk and enough theory being thrown around. Let's go and pick up exercises three and four and have a look at exercise three, where we're going to start stepping through and building a GLM instead of an LM. So if you pick up exercise three, um, let's have uh, 10 minutes on that. And then I'll start to go through that. Uh, I'll start to go through in about five minutes time because I realize I'm talking quite a lot and we're going, um, we're getting late on time. So have, have a crack for five minutes or so and then I'll start going through. So do remember you're using a GLM instead of an LM and you wanted to include a family and that family is binomial. So I'll bring that back up onto the screen here. So this exercise uses the NHSR data sets package, um, which is a package of health related NHS data, which is supposed to be for training and learning. So we've got some ONS mortality, we've got a hospital data set, um, we've got some a &E attendance data. Uh, and if you've got a data set that would be really useful for people to learn R with or to use as examples, please consider contributing it because it, it'd be great to expand this. I think we'd be particularly keen on population level stuff, uh, mental health stuff, um, anything to do with primary care, because at the moment we're a little bit hospital centric. Uh, 
Right. Hi there, everyone. Um, sorry for my distraction there. Um, I just had a message from my wife telling me that her car's broken down and I'll need to scarf her in about uh, half an hour to go and pick up my kids. Uh, <laughs> the realities of life. Um, so I'm going to crack on if that's all right and um, go through some of the answers. So loading the NHSR data sets package. So first thing, I have a quick look at the, the data set. Um, so let's look at the view. So here we've got an ID, so that's just a row ID, an organization name, an age of a patient, a length of stay, and then whether or not they died as a zero one. So what we're going to try and do is predict death, ultimately using the age and the length of stay. So let's build a GLM uh, using age. So I'm going to call this GLM1 because I'm terrible at naming things. Um, so we want to, and a, a handy tip I find, if you expand in your environment here, the, the data frame you're using, you can see all the column names. So it avoids you uh, typing anything wrong because you can see them. So it's death with a capital, Hilda. Age. Death is explained by age, and my data again is uh, so it's not framing in this time. Sorry, is is LOS model, and my family is binomial. So running that, let's have a look at the model, and I'm primarily going to focus on whether um, the parameters are significant, uh, statistically significant here or not, rather than the exact magnitude of the coefficients. So looking at that, intercept is, um, and age appears to be, which is, so it's, it's a little bit less than the 0.5 threshold for a 95% limit. So let's try this with a scale model as well and see what that looks like. Should we copy that properly this time? this FC. I'm going to wrap scale around this here. It does the same thing in our summary. So we're going to do uh, GLM on Again, we have the same significance, but we have different parameter estimates there because it changes our interpretation to be the z-score interpretation. That um, change um, from the average based on the standard deviation. So. The thing I was saying before was about exponentiating them as well. And I, I changed my slides somewhat, so I didn't show you the exact function for that. But when we've got our model, so it's called what here? It's called GLM, our model. So the model has a whole bunch of extractor functions. So you can use coefficients. I was hoping he spelt it correctly. And in doing that, it pulls out the model coefficients for you. So you don't have to be copying and pasting them out of the, um, the summary. Um, but I said I wanted to exponentiate them. And in R, the exponentiation function is exp. I wrap this in exp. And then run that. So that exponentiates my coefficients. And that's turned them into odds ratios for me. But let's take our model a stage further then, and we'll put the length of stay in. Let's look at length of stay. I'm gonna call this two. I'm going to scale length of stay as well. Yeah, um, 
to SE. Ah, okay. So this has now said that length of stay is significant, but age isn't significant, like at all. Age isn't significant in death, predicting death. I don't know about you, but that seems a little bit strange to me, like maybe that's not reasonable. But thinking back to our example with the MedPAR data a minute ago, maybe that's because there's something going on. Maybe that's because we've got an interaction going on. So let's try looking at it that way. So I'm going to put an interaction term in and call that three. So rather than just that, let's use the multiply function as well. And include GLM3. Aha, so what we've got here is that age isn't necessarily significant on its own. Length of stay is, because presumably length of stay, people, longer people, people are in hospital, they, presumably it's a more severe thing they're in for. But we also can see that age combined with length of stay is significant. And actually it's a negative effect. So the effects of length of stay uh, and age when they're combined need to get blunted slightly because they would be over dramatic. So if you combine being elderly with being in for a very long time, the sum of those two is not quite right. It's it's too far is what the model is saying. So that's why with a negative coefficient, it would blunt the combined effects together. So how might we compare these models? Um, well, we were looking at the model metrics package before, weren't we? So if I use that AUC score, so this was the thing we were talking about earlier. So let's have a look at GLM on SC. That's a 0.59, so 59% uh, of the variation in the data was explained by the model. And we included age as well. That went up to 0.6594, so that's nearly 66% of the variation in the model was explained by the data. But if we then do this with the interaction term as well, that was number three. Yeah, it's jumped up to 0.7. So actually we're getting to sort of reasonable model territory now. So it does help to think about, um, I guess, the parameterization of your model as you go. So forgive me, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and we're going to go through the last section on prediction. So given that we built some models, we might want to use that model that we've just fitted to predict onto some new patients. So let's say you build a model for the risk of heart attack. You might then want to put the next patient set of patients through that to predict what risk you think those patients are going to have for heart attack and maybe put in an intervention to uh, observe those patients more, to catch it in advance or something or other like that. So the idea is that given a model, a model ultimately is estimating a formula, right? So it's the intercept plus a coefficient times a predictor repeated however many times. So what your model is trying to work out is that equation. And once it's got that equation, it can apply it to other things because you just plug your new da data variables into your X positions and it predicts your Y. Um, but that's actually quite easy to do in R. So again, we wrap our model in another function. So if you wrap it in predict, um, it will then predict the model out. So what I've done here is I've created a new column in my MedPAR data set from before. So that's what the dollar sign is. It's uh, it's saying a column named PREDS, so predictions. So I created a new column called predictions, which is predicting the output from my GLM. Now, when you're using a, a linear model, there's no transformation. So we're not using a link function. So you just use predict and it's fine. But when you're doing it through a GLM, if you remember, we're doing that on a link function scale. So we were doing it on the logit scale for the, um, the GLM that used a binomial, so the logistic model. So you have to tell it that you don't want predictions on the link scale. So you don't want to know the log odds of someone's death. You want to know the probability of the death or the odds of their death. So 
if you tell it to predict the type of response rather than so you've got two options you've got link or response if you tell it to predict response what it actually does is it predicts the probability of the event and then i've added a little bit of dplyr code there to take the top five um, based on the medpar data set um, so we're looking at the the, the ones that had the the um, that should say medpar pred sorry um, that have the the highest predictions. So there's a bunch of things you can do once you've got the predictions. You could say who's got the, you know the the highest likelihood of um, of death. Maybe we should try and intervene in those patients first. Um, or you could do other analyses, like you could say uh, which patients died but had the lowest predicted risk of death. Um, and then maybe you might be questioning whether or not that was preventable. So you're you're saying who died but was predicted to really not have died according to our model. So your predictions start to become really useful because you can use them for future patients, you can use them for analysis of the data that you already had. So this is uh, again using the, the, the 10 cases with the highest predicted risk, so it's putting them out in that order. So that's a reasonably simple um, addition there. So the last bit of this section here, um, because we're getting a little close on time, what I'm going to do is uh, just pick up from my solutions example and work through those with you. So I'm sorry that we're a bit rushed for time today. Uh, I think that was me um, underestimating the setup time it took us at the beginning. Um, but we've done the first exercise here. And that was using the AIC. So we want to do our predictions. So using the function that we used before, if we just do it on the linear model, so first of all, let's go back to the Framingham one that we did in the, on the first one, on exercises one and two. Because we don't have to transform that back because it's a linear model and it doesn't use a link function, um, you can get away with just straight up predicting based on your model um, in um, my other solution, I call it LM6. Uh, what did I call it here? I called it BMI smoke age, I think. Oh. Was it BMI age edu? That was it. I age edu. I gave it a different name in my other example. So what I've done there, if I open my Framingham data frame, is I've created that new column on the end called preds. So that's the predicted systolic blood pressure for each of those patients. And then you could compare that to the actual observed systolic blood pressure. So in this patient, it was observed to be 106, but my model predicted 122. Here, this one was predicted as 134, on my, um, but actually had 121. Actually, anecdotally, a lot of those are predicting higher than was actually observed. So does that tell you something about whether or not the model was right? Maybe it's not the most accurate, but maybe you want to then plot the predictions versus the actual, um, and that's what one of those model diagnostic plots was. So let's have a look. Let's compare them as a scatter plot. This is a ggplot scatter plot here. So I'm now using the y value, so that's the systolic blood pressure, so that's the observed value versus the predicted value. Okay. So this is the observed versus the predicted. And I've put a smoother on there to give it some sort of direction. So it is a little bit all over the place, isn't it, really? So for things that are predict 140-ish, our model is saying, in general, it predicts around here, which is sort of 140-ish, right? So it wasn't the best model. Um, but it's giving you a sort of reasonable ballpark there. But I would probably say you'd need a better model than our, um, what, 23-ish percent before you would start doing anything serious with it. But let's do the same for our logistic model then. So we were using the length of stay model data set. Um, and I called it something different. I called it GLM3SC. So I am going to run that. But I've also told it that I want the type of output I want is a predicted probability. So I want the response, not the link function. So again, let's try and plot that in the same way, right? Let's predict the um, the output, so the outcome against the predicted risk. That's not very helpful. 
And then that's that's the tricky question then, is that why would that not be helpful? Well, that's because death is a zero or a one. So trying to plot it as a scatterplot doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? So how else might you want to then visualize it? So this is where you have to remember that your data type affects the way you're going to look at the data outwards. So maybe we could look at it as a box plot, and this is a, a ggplot a box plot, where we're going to look at um, the X grouping is going to be whether or not patients died, and then we're going to look at the distribution of their predicted risk. So in the patients who survived, this was the distribution of their predicted risk. So this is the median value, and these are the outer quartiles. And these are the predicted risks in the patients who died. So the median predicted risk in the patients who died was greater than the patients who survived. But it's not hugely different, right? It, it doesn't, it's not glaringly higher. But we can see here from the output of our model that our model is predicting those patients who died as having a higher risk. And you can do the same thing with a bunch, whole bunch of different plots, but that's just, uh, I guess, ggplot showing off. Um, so a lot of people don't like these violin plots, but I kind of like them. They're kind of like two-way histograms that you can stack. Um, you can look at the, the histograms of the predictions. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily as helpful because they're sort of overlaid histograms. Uh, or indeed, the densities is another way people will sometimes do it. So you look at the density of the predicted probability of death. So some of the patients had really high predictions, but most of them were obviously encapsulated in this peak here. Whereas most of the ones who survived had a had a big chunk of lower ones here with a very low risk. So it does look like our model's doing okay at predicting the deaths, but it's not predicting that much higher risk. So I'm going to jump back over to my slides here. So what I didn't do is I, I didn't uh, talk to you about the um, the odds ratios, and I created some extra slides earlier on log ratio, odds ratios, but I don't believe they've um, they've updated on my GitHub. So sorry about that. Um, so that will be on the the material for you uh, when you download it all. But what I'm going to do is summarise now because we're on half four. Um, so what we've gone through today was trying to predict one variable with another in R. So we're trying to predict a Y with an X or many X's. So we can do that with correlation, but correlation really just shows us the strength of association. So how tightly packed things are when they're correlated and whether they uh, are positively or negatively correlated. So what direction are they going in? When one increases, does the other increase or does it decrease? But if we use a regression model instead, that allows us a lot more power over quantifying how much each of the predictors affects the outcome. So that's what our regression coefficients were. They were our betas, the things that are in the first column of the summary table. Um, and we can stack as many of those predictors as we want. So whilst we started initially with just one predictor, then we started to add predictors in. We looked at the Framingham data with uh, BMI and age and smoking status, and we also looked at education. So our regression coefficients then are our quantification of exactly how much each of those predictors affects the Y. And we also saw that there's a, it's possible to then scale them. And that scale helps us with our interpretation because if you use the scale function on all your numeric variables, it allows you to interpret the intercept as the average value per um, whatever your data points are. So I, mean, I often say per patient, but that's because I work predominantly on patient data sets, but it's per unit of Y. Um, when we were measuring whether or not our models were any good, we were using uh, a, an R-squared, and the adjusted R-squared compensates for having more variables. So our R-squared was interpreted as the proportion of variation that our model explained, and sort of, by extension, the, the things you've used to predict it explain. It doesn't directly transfer over to using the generalized linear model. Um, but there is an equivalent, which was the C statistic or the AUC or the ROC receiver or the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve, which are used with the, the model metrics package. But you can interpret that again in the same way as the proportion of the variation that's explained in the model. We then chipped on over to um, the GLM or the generalized linear model, which allows you to apply the same things that we've done in the linear model onto nonlinear 
responses like zero one binary things we're using the binomial distribution or counts using the Poisson distribution. So the one difference being that we needed to uh, give it a family argument. So we tell it what type of distribution. So that was binomial in our um, data set where we were looking at deaths. We also um, briefly hinted on interaction terms because not all of the, the X variables that we use are going to be independent. So things like um, age and length of stay, for example, we might naturally expect um, more elderly patients in our data sets to have stayed in hospital longer in general uh, because of other comorbid conditions, for example. And that might not be directly comparable with the same length of stay that a younger person has in terms of its predictive value for death. So an interaction, um, and just like we saw with um, the idea of, of the age and cigarettes in the, uh, the Framingham data set, it might be that an interaction allows us to separate the effects of the individual terms and the combined term. Uh, and we can also then use our model objects that we've used to predict, uh, and then we can use them to predict onto new data sets. Uh, if you're going to use them for a new data set, the argument that I didn't show you there was um, in the predict argument, you also add new data and you put a new data frame into it. But that data frame has to have all of the same uh, names of columns. So if you if you predict on age, cigarettes and BMI, then the new data set also has to have age, cigarettes and BMI by definition. And for those of you who are interested, I've got a little challenge for you, which is the exercise five, which is pick up that Framingham data set again and try and build the best model you can for the CHD risk column. And I've got my solution in the solutions folder. So you can have a go, crack on, see what you think, uh, and then try and uh, compare it with the solution that I've provided. But see if you can apply what we've done today. So pick up the Framingham data set, maybe have a little look at some of the predictors, maybe graph them and see what uh, makes sense to you as a, as a potential predictor, and then see if you can predict the column called CHD risk. Okay, thank you very much for your time today. I'm sorry we were cut short on some of the exercises. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes for questions. Um, if not, you're very welcome to contact me. Um, my email address is um, c.maney at nhs.net. Uh, I'll ask my NHS, our colleagues to take that bit off the recording maybe. Um, but you're very welcome to ask me questions and I'm, I'm always happy to venture an opinion or find me on the NHSR community Slack channel. Um, and there's a bunch of us who like regression models, so we're always happy to, to answer your questions. Thanks for your time today, everyone.